everyone welcome to my channel anupma biology classes in this video our topic is common disease in humans which is taken from immunology series chapter 8 part 2 of cvsc class 12 in the following account a few representative members from different groups of pathogenic organism the disease caused by them and the preventive and control measures against this disease are briefly described so at first here the first common disease in case of human is typhoid so what is typhoid typhoid is a common bacterial disease caused by a rod like bacterium salmonella typhi which is a facultative anaerobe gram negative bacilli and distinguishes from other bacteria by biochemical and antigen structure Typhoid is commonly found in the intestine of man. The disease is common in children of age group of 1 to 15 years. Nearly 2.5 million people suffer from typhoid disease every year. Now, what is the mode of transmission of typhoid? The disease is spreads by food and water contaminated with feces of the patient. house flies may carry the pathogens from the feces to the food milk and water the causative organism enter via mouth reach the intestine and cause lesions in the intestinal wall now the symptoms and treatment of typhoid so there are following a 5 to 21 days incubation period typical sign including diffuse abdominal pain headache prolonged fever anorexia nausea loss of appetite and constipation or sometimes diarrhea progressively appear daytime drowsiness and nighttime insomnia are characteristic sign of typhoid possible complications include gastrointestinal hemorrhage and perforation heart failure and encephalitis effective antibiotics are available and the prognosis in patients under treatment is usually favorable so the common symptoms of typhoid are constant high fever in the first and second week which is followed by gradually decreased fever in the third and fourth week headache extreme weakness abdominal pain constipation and inflammation in ileum and colon occur in case of typhoid liver and spleen become enlarged typhoid can be confirmed by bedol test now what are the preventive measures of the typhoid so in case of typhoid preventive measures include proper community sanitation a screening of water supply and food from contamination by flies and personal cleanliness cooks and food handlers in eating establishments should not be carrier of the typhoid bacteria typhoid cases should be immediately reported to the health authorities natural calamities such as flood and hurricanes may cause epidemic of the disease typhoid vaccine provides immunity for about 3 years now the control of typhoid fever so if we talk about the control here you can see that the measures directed to reservoir which is case detection and treatment isolation disinfection of stools and urine and detection and treatment of carriers in case of measures at routes of transmission so here water sanitation food sanitation excreta disposal and fly control and in case of measures for susceptibles so here immunoprophylaxis and health education so these are the control of typhoid fever now what is the management of typhoid fever so in general supportive care includes maintenance of adequate hydration antipyretics appropriate nutrition etc and in a specific condition antimicrobial therapy in the main stage treatment selection of antibiotics should be based on its efficacy availability and cost 
chloramphenicol, ampicillin, amoxicillin, trimethoprene, and sulfamethazole, fluoroquinones, etc. are the drugs or antibiotics which are used to treat the disease. In case of quinoline resistance, here you can see that is azithromycin, third generation cephalosporins, that is septria zone. So these are the managements of typhoid fever and all about the typhoid. Now, after this, the second disease is pneumonia. So what is pneumonia? In human beings, pneumonia is caused by bacteria like Streptococcus pneumoniae commonly called as pneumococcus and haemophilus influenzae. It is a serious disease of the lungs. Fluid collects in the alveoli and bronchioles with the result lungs do not get sufficient air to support life. Now, what are the mode of transmission of pneumonia? The disease is spreads by sputum of the patient. Pneumococci are inhaled and get logged in the bronchioles. Alveolar walls inflame and secrete a protein-rich fluid. The latter acts as a culture medium for the bacteria and blocks the bronchioles. Incubation period is just 1 to 3 days. Pneumonia commonly occurs in the old people. So here you can see here a healthy person's alveoli and inflamed air sacs that means a person who has pneumonia. Now, what are the main symptoms of infectious pneumonia? So, the onset of pneumonia is usually sudden with a single setting chill. This is followed by fever, pain while breathing, cough and headache. In severe cases, the lips and fingernails may turn grey to bluish in colour. Pneumonia usually follows lowered body resistance due to exposure, malnutrition, alcohol or drug intoxication or infusion of some other disease such as influenza. Sputum is bloody or rusty. So these are the main symptoms of pneumonia. Here in this picture you can see that is systemic which is high fever and chills. In the skin, calmness, blueness, shakar. In case of lungs, cough with sputum or plague, shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain, hemoptysis, and in case of muscles, fatigue, eggs. In central cases, headaches, loss of appetite, mood swing. In vascular cases, low blood pressure. In case of heart, high heart rate. In case of gastric, nausea and vomiting. And in case of joints, pain occurs. So these are the main symptoms in case of pneumonia. Now, what are the preventive measures of the pneumonia? The main preventive measures is vaccination. In the event of an influenza outbreak, unprotected patients at risk from complications should be vaccinated immediately and given chemoprophylaxis with either Seltamivir or Zanamivir for two weeks, that is, until vaccine induced antibiotic levels are sufficiently high. Because of an increased risk of pneumococcal infection, even among patients without obstructive lung disease, a smoker should be strongly encouraged to stop smoking. Seven valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine that is produces T cells dependent antigens that results in long term immunologic memory. So these are the preventive measures or prevention of the pneumonia. So in short in case of preventive measures frequent turning of bed ridden patients and early ambulations as much as possible. Coughing and breathing techniques, sterilization of respiratory therapy equipment and suctioning of secretion in the unconscious who have poor cough and swallowing reflexes to prevent aspirations of secretions and its accumulation. So these are the main preventive measures of pneumonia. Now how can we control pneumonia? So vaccination which includes the use of vaccines against streptococcus pneumonia and haemophilus influenza type B. 
case management in the community health centers and the hospitals. Exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life is control pneumonia, improvement in nutrition and prevention of low birth weight, control of indoor air pollution and promotion of healthy environment and the last is prevention and management of HIV infection. So these are the controlling mechanism of pneumonia. So this is all about pneumonia. Now the third common disease is common cold. So what is common cold? It is one of the most infectious human ailments caused by renovirus. The viruses infect the nose and respiratory passage but not the lungs. So in case of common cold, viruses renovirus is spread through respiratory droplets, highly contagious, initially mucous membranes of nose, pharynx, swollen and the symptoms are nasal congestion, watery discharge, mouth breathing, change in tone of voice, short throat, headache, slight fever and cough. So here you can see a cold and flu infographic elements. So at first in here you can see the symptoms that is cough, short throat, fatigue, runny or stuffy nose, headache, sneezing, fever and body aches are the symptoms of common cold. And how can you prevent it? By rinse hand, warm drinks, protection mask, antiseptic, disposable wipes, foods with vitamins, quality slip and exercise. So, so these are the preventive measures of the cold and flu. Now how, what is the mode of transmission of the common cold? The viruses are transmitted directly through inhalation of droplets resulting from cough or sneeze of an infected person or through contaminated objects such as utensils, books, paints, doorknobs, computer keyboards, mouse, etc. and cause the infection in a healthy person. So, the common symptoms are, you know that nasal cognition and discharge, sore throat, hoarseness, cough, headache, tiredness, etc. and it usually least for 3 to 7 days. So, how can you treat this common cold? By cold medicines, by cough syrup, by get plenty of rest, by drink plenty of warm fluids, and decongestion of the nasal spray. So these are the treatment for the common cold. Now how can you distinguish the common cold and flu? So there are some symptoms and signs which differentiate the influenza and cold in which the first sign and symptom is onset symptom. In case of influenza abrupt and in case of cold gradual. In case of fever, in influenza usual, in case of cold rare. In case of aches, in case of influenza usual and in case of cold slight. Next sign and symptoms are chill. In case of influenza fairly common but in case of cold uncommon. Next sign and symptom is fatigue and weakness. In influenza usual but in cold sometimes. Here, the next sign and symptoms is sneezing in influenza sometimes but in cold common. Next sign and symptoms is a stuffy nose which is sometimes in influenza and common in case of cold. According to sore throat which is sometimes in influenza and in cold common. Then chest discomfort and the cough which is common in influenza and mild to moderate in the cold. And the last sign and symptom is headache which is common in influenza and rare in case of cold. So these are some sign and symptoms which differentiate influenza from the common cold. Now after this the fourth is malaria which is very common disease in case of humans. So Malaria has been for thousands of years a very serious disease of the tropical and temperate regions. It was almost 
eliminated a few years back with the efforts of World Health Organization and our National Malaria Eradication Program but unfortunately it has reappeared again. So, malaria is a life-threatening disease which is caused by parasites and here transmitted to people through the bites of infected female Anopheles mosquito. It is preventable and curable. Now, what are the symptoms of malaria? The attack of malaria is preceded by yawning, tiredness, headache and muscular pain. During the fever, the patient feels chilly and severe and has acute headache, nausea and high temperature. After a few hours, the body perspires freely and the temperature becomes normal. The cycle is repeated if no medicine is taken. Blood a smear made during fever shows the malarial parasites. No parasites are seen at other times. In chronic cases, there is general weakness and anemia due to large-scale destruction of red blood corpuscles, that is RBC. This is also accompanied by enlargement of spleen and liver. Now, the malaria is caused by the toxin which is produced in the human body by the malarial parasite plasmodium. So, in this picture you can see a sporozoid of plasmodium vivax entering a red blood carpusel. Now, causes of malaria. What are the main causes of malaria? Malaria is caused by the plasmodium parasite. The parasite can be spread to human through the bites of infected mosquitoes. There are many different types of plasmodium parasite but only five types cause malaria in humans and they are plasmodium falciparum which is the most common type of malaria parasite and is responsible for most malaria deaths worldwide. Then plasmodium vivax, plasmodium ovale, plasmodium malari and plasmodium nolesi. So these are the causative agents of malaria. Now, what are the mode of transmission of the malaria? The malaria parasites are carried from the infected to the healthy persons by the female Anopheles mosquito. The mosquito picks up the parasites with the blood when it bites an infected person. When this infected mosquito bites a healthy person, parasites migrate into his blood with the saliva, which the mosquito injects before sucking up blood to prevent its clotting. So, when the mosquito bites a person, it injects sporozoids into them. This travels to the liver where they reproduce asexually, producing mirozoids. Mirozoids replicate repeatedly in red blood cells, then burst out and invade fresh red blood cells, which can lead to billions of infected cells in the bloodstream and cause the effects of the disease. Then sometimes, mirozoids in infected blood cells develop into gametocytes, that is a sperm and egg precursor cells that are carried around in the blood. Then, a mosquito bites and the ingested infected red blood cells which burst opens into the ins insect's gut. These, the gametocytes develop into gametes. Then male and female gametes fuse to create a zygote. Then the zygote develops into a moving okinids that burrows into the mosquito's gut wall. Then the okinid turns into a oocyte containing thousands of infective sporozoites and after 8 to 15 days, the oocytes burst opens and its sporozoids travel to the mosquito's salivary gland. So these are the way of transmission of malaria. So in case of malaria transmission cycle, at first, first infected person, infected red blood cells, then it enters into the second infected mosquito, then it enters into the second infected person. Then here you can see how the plasmodium gametocytes present which is in the first infected mosquito, then to first infected person, then to infected red blood cells in the first infected person and then into the 
second infected person with the help of second infected mosquito so this is all about the malaria transmission cycle now here the types of malarial parasite which is plasmodium so there are four species of plasmodium which causes different kinds of human malaria in which the first one that is plasmodium falciparum it alone is capable of causing three types of malaria that is quotidian malaria which attacks almost daily malignant tertian malaria which recurs every 48 hours but is very severe and often fatal and irregular malaria this species is found only in the tropical region second is plasmodium vivax plasmodium vivax causes benign tertian malaria which attacks every third day that is after 48 hours and recurrent attacks of fever are called parozymes the fever is mild and seldom fatal this species is widespread in the tropical and temperate regions including india next is here plasmodium malari it causes quartan malaria which recurs every fourth day that is after 72 hours this species is found in both tropical and temperate region but it is not very common and the last is plasmodium ovel which is caused benign tertian malaria which recurs every 48 hours this species is found only in the west africa and south america so these are all four types of plasmodium here you can see the plasmodium types they are type that causes malaria and endemic areas and febrile seizure period and the involvement and severity so this table shows the differences between the various type of parasites that causes malaria now incubation period of the parasite malaria so here you can see all the species that is plasmodium falciparum and the incubation period in the liver cycle is 7 to 14 days Next species is Plasmodium vivax and the incubation period is 12 to 17 days with relapse up to 3 years. Next is Plasmodium ovel which incubation period is 9 to 18 days with relapse up to 20 years. And the last is Plasmodium malaria which incubation period is 13 to 40 days. So this is the incubation period of the malaria parasite that is Plasmodium now the history behind malaria the name malaria was given by maculoge in 1872 on the belief that it was caused by the foul air of the marshy localities lancisi an italian physician had suggested relationship between swamps mosquito and malaria in 1770 In 1880, Laveran, a French army medical officer, discovered the malarial parasite in the blood of a malarial patient. He was awarded in 1907 Nobel Prize for this discovery. Golgi confirmed Laveran findings in 1885. Sir Ronald Ross of the Indian Medical Service established the mosquito larva mosquito malaria relationship on August 29. in 1897 ever since called the mosquito day he was awarded in 1902 nobel prize for this discovery so here you can see in case of plasmodium it completes its life cycle in two phases and two host in which the first one that is the asexual phase in the human host and the sexual phase in the female anopheles mosquito host Man and mosquitoes are regarded secondary intermediate host and primary or final host respectively. The life cycle of Plasmodium vivax may be subdivided into three phases: a phase of growth and asexual multiplication occurring in man and called cytogony, 
then sexual phase or gamogony which starts in man and is completed in the mosquito and an asexual multiplicative phase termed sporogony in the mosquito so in case of malaria how malaria occurs so here you can see the life cycle of the plasmodium vivax female anopheles mosquito bites human infected with the malaria and picks up plasmodium gamete cells then the sexual phase of plasmodium life cycle takes place inside mosquito gam gametes fused to form zygotes meiosis takes place sporozoites are produced and migrate to the salivary glands then infected mosquito bites another human injecting saliva that contains plasmodium sporozoites then plasmodium sporozoites enter into the liver and here the sporozoites infect liver cells and multiply asexually infected liver cells burst releasing plasmodium cells called merozoites that infect red blood cells then merozoites reproduce asexually inside red blood cells and infected red blood cell burst releasing merozoites that infect other red blood cells some cells release gametes that can infect mosquitoes so this is the life cycle of the plasmodium so in case of life cycle of malaria here you can see a complete life cycle which uh, occur between the two host that is the mosquito and the human so in case of mosquito here you can see that gamogamy in stomach occur and in asexual life cycle occur in case of the human body so what are the steps in case of malaria cycle at first here you can see the point that is for second third fourth fifth sixth seven eight nine so at first infected mosquito bites in human sporozoites migrate through blood stream to the liver of human then sporozoites undergo cytogony in liver cells and merozoites are produced then merozoites released into blood stream from liver may infected new red blood cells then merozoites develops into ring stays in red blood cells then ring stays grows and divides producing merozoites then merozoites are released when red blood cells rupture some merozoites infect new red blood cells and some develop into male and female gametocytes then another mosquito bites infected humans and ingest gametocytes then in mosquitoes digestive tract gametocytes unite to form zygote and the resulting sporozoites migrate to salivary glands of mosquito so sexual reproduction occur in case of mosquito and sexual asexual reproduction occur in case of human so this is the life cycle of the plasmodium vivax the a complexion that causes malaria now after this what is the control strategies for malaria in case of control strategy we can kill asexual forms with the help of chloroquine plus primaquine in early diagnosis and treatment stages in case of man the host while in case of mosquito the vector it prevent development within the mosquito and use vaccine for it then prevent breeding avoid water logging kill larvae prevent entry that means close door and windows and prevent biting that is kill adult mosquitoes use nets and repellents to protect from mosquito bites so this is all about the control strategies and in case of vaccine in malaria malaria vaccines are an area of intensive research emergence of artemisinin and multi drug resistant strains of especially plasmodium falciparum are driving research current approaches are focusing on recombinant proteins and attenuated whole organism vaccines various vaccines have reached the state of clinical trials most demonstrated insufficient immunogenicity so the malaria vaccine candidate that is rts as aso1 and rts as aso1 is the most advanced vaccine candidate against the most deadly form of human malaria that is plasmodium falciparum so this is all about the vaccine 
so in case of control measures of malaria there are two types of control measures in which the first one is offensive measure the offensive measures can be taken against both the organism that is mosquito and malarial parasite involved in malaria in which the first one that is the offensive measures against mosquito so what we can do in this offensive measures and the second is offensive measures against parasites of the malaria so in case of offensive measures mosquitoes can be destroyed by some methods like drain off or fill up all ditches ponds and pools with earth so that the mosquitoes may not find water to breathe if the ever places are too large to be drained off or filled up a sprinkle kerosene oil or solution of ddt on water so that the mosquitoes larvae and the pupae may not breathe fresh air and may die of suffocation if the water of the ever places is to be used for drinking or other domestic purposes add larvicidal feces ducks dragonfly larvae and the insectivorous plants as all these will eat up the mosquito larvae cover the drains or make underground drains to eliminate breeding ground of mosquitoes clear the sluggish drains and water course of a aquatic vegetation to speed up the water flow this will sweep the eggs larvae and pupae to sewers or rivers and seas where they may perish spray suitable insecticides such as ddt and bhc in all and around the human habitations to kill the adult mosquitoes the latter can also be killed or driven out of the houses by fumigation with the sulfur the adult mosquitoes can also be avoided by removing unnecessary vegetation from and around the houses next is offensive measures against parasite of malaria the malarial parasites can be killed by taking suitable medicines originally quinine derived from the bark of a peruvian tree that is cinchona was used these days synthetic drugs that is chloroquine phosphate and primaquine are used most effective than this is daraprim it is slow in action but in due course of time kills the parasite both in the blood and the liver and also in the mosquito that fits on the blood of an infected person the drugs mentioned above can also be taken as prophylactic measures the malarial parasite are increasingly become resistance to drugs and mosquitoes to ddt and other insecticides now after this the second control measure is defensive measure the defensive measures include the precautions by which we protect ourselves from mosquito without killing them so at first keep hands and feet cover in the evening apply some kerosene here insect repellent that is mosquito oil or cream to the exposed part of the body at night so that mosquitoes do not bite slip under mosquito net to avoid mosquito bites a screen all habitations from mosquitoes with wire gauze over doors windows and ventilators build house on high sites away from swamps and vegetations to avoid mosquito so these are all about the control measures of malaria that is two types offensive measures in which it can be taken against mosquitoes and malarial parasite which is involved in malaria and the second is defensive measures which is include precautions by which we protect ourselves from mosquitoes without killing them now after this the fifth disease is here that is amoebic dysentery so what is amoebic dysentery amoebiasis is widespread in india due to poor sanitary conditions and polluted drinking water the disease is caused by entamoeba histolytica all over the world the parasite was first discovered in russia by loesch in 1857 it lives in the large intestine and lower part of the small intestine of humans so 
what is the mode of transmission infection occurs by ingesting cyst with food and drinks and these are carried by flies from feces to food and drinks Entamoeba histolytica has a irregular body with a single nucleus and a many food vacuoles in the granular endoplasm. In this picture you can see the causative agent of amoebic dysentery and its cyst which is Entamoeba histolytica. It lacks contractile vacuole. It moves with a single plasmodium pseudopodium consisting largely of the clear ectoplasm. Its nutrition is mainly holozoic. Respiration anaerobic and reproduction asexual. It injures intestinal lining and feeds on erythrocytes and cell debris. It also takes bacteria, that is, Entamoeba histolytica is monogenetic and completes life cycle in a single host. It periodically forms rounded cysts which escape with host feces. So, and amoeba histolytica secretes a proteolytic enzyme that is cytolysine that eroded the mucous membrane of the intestine. This may form bleeding ulcers that produce dysentery. In this disease, the patient passes out blood and mucus with a stool. He also experiences severe gripping pain in the abdomen, fever, nausea, exhaustion and nervousness. In chronic cases, the intestinal wall is punctured. This may prove fatal. <clears throat> so, what are the control measures of amoebic dysentery? At first here you can see the cyst which is entered with the help of contaminated food and water ingested. Then invasive lumen dwelling forms, invasive form occur, then trophozoites in colon, then cyst passed in the feces contaminating motor and food and this is the cycle of the amoebic dysentery. So here you can see the mature cyst which enters by the ingestion then it shows the excitation, XI, XI, XI then trophozoite, then multiplication occur, then cyst form or trophozoites form. Then it shows the complete cycle of the amoebic dysentery. Here A shows the non-invasive colonization, B shows the intestinal disease and C shows the extra-intestinal disease. If we talk about the control measures of the amoebic dysentery. So here you can see the preventive measures in which the first one that is general cleanliness and washing of hands with soap and water before handling food. Washing of vegetables and fruits before taking. Protection of fruits and drinks from dust, flies and cockroaches. Avoid putting grass twigs and leaves from lawns into the mouth. Disposal of human feces by underground sewerage system. Adequate cooking of food to destroy the cyst. And the last is taking of suitable medicines by infected persons under the advice of a physician. So, educating people in the simple hygiene would perhaps be the most important measures of all. Now, after this, the sixth common disease is Ascariasis. So, if we talk about the Ascariasis, here in this picture you can see, which is caused by roundworm Ascaris lumbriquidis in female. Female is large in size in comparison to male. The roundworms leaves in the human small intestine. It lies free having no organs for attachment. It takes host digested food by sucking through the mouth. It means it shows the holozoic nutrition. So in case of here that means life history, man gets infection by taking a scarce egg with the food and water. Children become infected by ingesting soil, eggs hatched in the host intestine in a few hours, each liberating a tiny worm called juvenile. Then later, it grows into an adult worm in 2 to 2.5 months. The adult worms has cylindrical body tapering at one end, 20 to 40 cm long in female and 15 to 30 cm long in male. Male's hind end is curved ventrally. 
mature male and female worms copulate in the host intestine where the female latter lays eggs the eggs pass out in the feces and can remain a live in the soil for several years the eggs are carried to food and drinks water by air flies and cockroaches as caries has no intermediate host now after this here the pathogenicity that means effect on the host so the effect of escaries infection depends largely on the degrees of infection light infection that is presence of only a few individuals generally has no effect on host health heavy infection however proves serious it causes weakness and anemia as the worms share host food toxins produced by the parasite causes irritation of intestinal mucosa and impair digestion nausea cough and severe colic pain may also result in this case the worm sometimes damage the mucous membrane and bring about enteritis or even peritonitis then blockage of the intestine and consequent death may also occur in this case as caries infected children may have poor growth and mental development so this is the effect on the host of as caries now what are the control measures so at first here you can see the adult mate in intestine then x passed in stools then mature in soil then human ingest infected x then larvae released into intestine and penetrate intestinal wall then larvae breaks into alveoli of lungs because it enters into the circulation and migrate up to trachea over epiglottis then complete maturation in the intestine so this is all about the transmission of the escariases now after this what are the control measures of escariases first that is disposal of human feces by underground sewerage system then thoroughly washing vegetables and fruits before eating teaching children early in life to wash hands before meal parents should ensure that the children do not acquire the habit of taking soil protection of food articles from dust and flies adult worms can be removed by giving the patient suitable drugs so this is all about the control measures of escariases now after this here the seventh common disease is filariasis filariasis is caused by the filarial worm ucheraria bancrofti in this picture you can see female and male ucheraria bancrofti has a long thread like white body tapering at either end the adult male and female worms are here that means 40 mm and 80 mm long respectively they live in the lymphatic vessels and the lymphatic glands of the human their primary host the worm is viviparous and the female delivers young worms called microfilariae the latter shift to deep blood vessels primarily of the lungs at night they migrate to the superficial blood vessels of the skin and are sucked by culex fatigan mosquito the intermediate host and vector so here they develop into infective larvae in about 10 days and migrate to the mouth parts of the mosquito when an infected mosquito bites a human host the larvae escape onto the skin then they enter the blood where the puncture hole left by the mosquito and infect the new host from the blood they migrate to the lymphatic vessels and the lymphatic glands here they grow into adults in about a year the adult worms live for some 5 to 8 years so here you can see the mode of transmission of the filariasis so at first the mosquito takes a blood meal that is l3 larvae enters into the skin then the adults in lymph lymphatics then adults produced sheeted microfilariae that migrate into lymph and blood channels then mosquito takes a blood meal then the microfilariae shed seed penetrate mosquito's midgut and migrate to thoracic muscles then l1 larvae 
which forms the L3 larvae then migrate to head and mosquitoes proboscis. So this is all about the stages in mosquitoes and humans and the cycle of the filariasis. So in common, in case of filariasis, L3 stage enters into, that means converted into the adult worm, which enters into the, converted into the microfilary, which all process occur in the human. Then microfilary converted into L1 stage larvae, which converted into L2 stage larvae, and then L3 stage larvae, which forms in the Culex mosquito. So this is the cycle which occur in the human and the Culex mosquito. Now, the effect on the host, that is pathogenicity. In acute cases, the filarial infection causes fever. In chronic cases, the worms block the lymphatic vessels. This causes enormous swelling of the affected part, which may be arm, foot, leg, mama or scrotum. This is followed by thickening of skin and subcutaneous tissue. Enlargement of legs gives the disease its name in elephantasis. The disease, though not fatal, causes considerable disfiguration and suffering and disability. So this is filariasis or elephantasis. Here in this picture you can see. So filariasis, filarial worm are thin filamentous nematode that are required following a bite from the arthropod vector namely black flies and mosquitoes. The parasites typically enter and interfere with the lymphatic functions or causes damaging inflammations in the organs they inhabit. Filariasis is a worldwide tropical disease best known as causes of elephantasis. Cases occur mostly in the North America. Filariasis is classified into three types, lymphatic, subcutaneous and serous cavity. Now, what are the pathogenicity of the filariasis? So, infection, that is vocariasis, mode of infection is an inoculative method through the bite of mosquito. Transmitting agent is the female mosquito Culex aedes and anopheles. Infective form is third stage larvae L3 stage. Portal of entry is skin. Site of localization is lymphatic system of superior or inferior extremities and the incubation period is about 1 to 2 years. Third stage infective larva grows to adult form. So this is the pathogenicity of the filariasis. Now, what are the prevention and control of the filariasis? The best way to prevent lymphatic filariasis is to avoid mosquito bites. The mosquito that carry the microscopic worms usually bite between the hours of the dusk and dawn. If you live in an area with the lymphatic filariasis at night, sleep in an air-conditioned room, sleep under a mosquito net. And between dusk and dawn, wear long sleeves and trousers and use mosquito repellent on exposed skin. So this is all about the filariasis. <coughs> now, the next disease is ring worms. Many fungi are also responsible for causing common infection disease in case of man. For instance, fungi belonging to genus Microsporum, which in this picture you can see, Trichophyton and Epidermophyton are responsible for ring worms in man. What are the symptoms? The common symptoms of ringworm infection are the appearance of dry scaly lesions on various parts of the body such as skin, nails and scalp. These lesions are accompanied by intestine itching, heat and moisture favor growth of fungi in skin, folds particularly in the groin and between the toes. Now, the ringworm causes and the risk factor. So, dermatophyte fungi not washing hands, close contact with those infected persons and the damp skin for extended time are the causes and risk factors of the ringworm. Now what are the methods of transmission? Ringworm is contagious and can spread in the following ways by human to human, direct skin to skin contact with an infected person. Then next is geophilic species that is keratin utilizing soil saprophytes. Then object to humans by ortho 
for filic species that is clothing to uh, towels bed lines combs or brushes and by animal to human that is zoophilic species that is dogs and cats especially kittens cows goats pigs and horses so these are the method of transmission of the ringworm now how can we prevent so don't share clothes a sports gear or towels to wear slippers in lockers room and public pools and bathing areas to shower after any sport that includes skin to skin contact to wear loose fitting cloth cotton clothes to keep a skin clean and dry to take the pets to the veterinary if it has patches of the missing hair which could be a sign of a fungal infection so this is the preventive measures of the ringworm now after this the next is chikungunya this disease is caused by chikungunya virus that is alpha virus the name chikungunya is derived from the nasty word for the diseases in which the patient lies doubled up as a result of severe pain in joints the chikungunya virus was first reported in india in 1963 recently cases of this disease have been reported from india since 2006 now in case of symptoms some common tips symptoms are fever muscle pain swelling rashes headaches and joint pains now what is the mode of transmission of disease primary reservoir is human then other reservoirs are monkeys rodents birds and some is small mammals so mode of transmission by mosquito bites and other modes of transmission that is uncommon is in uterine transmission can cause miscarriage in the first trimester intrabirth transmission newborn of a viremic mother needle prick laboratory exposure and no evidence of virus in the breast milk so this is the mode of transmission of chikungunya so this can occur by the the disease is spread through the bite of the aries aegypti mosquito which introduces viruses into the human body the fever is typically biphasic so in case of chikungunya which is transmitted through the bite of the aries aegypti and the aries bulbopictus mosquito the second is only found in isabel symptoms are just like dengue body aches uh, but uh, more intense in the joints and tendons can become chronic and causes blindness fever headache tiredness depression nausea rashes are also the symptoms and how can we prevent do not share water in open containers so that they do not become breeding sites for the mosquito cover tanks or containers for water for domestic use do not accumulate trash deposit of trash in your yard cut your grass regularly to destroy potential breeding or resting sites use mesh or screens on your windows and doors use repellent or long sleeves to avoid getting bitten so these are the preventive measures of the chikungunya and here you can see in complete and in detail that we are long sleeve short and long trousers use mosquito repellents if possible sleep under bed nets if possible set the air conditioning to a low temperature at night so mosquitoes do not like cold temperature pregnant women children under 12 years old and prevent here the immune disorders or severe chronic illness should be personalized advice so these are the preventive measures and the seeking protection from the chikungunya now after this the last third tenth disease is dengue fever dengue fever is caused by a mosquito borne flabby ribovirus the two types of dengue fever is common which is first one here the symptoms in this picture you can see that is uh, common symptoms in case of classical dengue fever or in case of dengue hemorrhagic fever so febrile phases critical phases and recovery phases so these are the symptoms so in case of classical dengue fever common symptoms of classical dengue fever includes abrupt onset of high fever muscle and joint pain rashes on the chest and upper limbs loss of sense of taste and appetite nausea and vomiting so in infants and young children and in the older children and adult which you can see in this picture and the second is dengue hemorrhagic fever 
Besides symptoms of the classical dengue fever, it also has uh, bleeding from nose, mouth, gums and skin browsing, severe persistent stomach pains, excessive thrust leading to dryness of mouth, pale skin, frequent vomiting and breathing problems. So these are the common symptoms of the dengue hemorrhagic fever. So how can we diagnose dengue which is clinical and the dengue which is hemorrhagic? So clinical definition of for the dengue fever is which is uh, normal that means classical dengue fever acute fibril viral disease frequently presenting with headaches bone or joint pain muscular pain rashes and leukopenia and in dengue hemorrhagic fever clinical definitions is fever or recent history of acute fever hemorrhagic manifestations low platelets count Objective evidences of leaky capillaries that is elevated hematocrate, low albumin and pleural or other eff effusions. So this is the diagnostic criteria of the classical and hemorrhagic dengue fever. So how does dengue spread? First bites dengue infected persons. Then mosquitoes ingested blood with the dengue virus takes 8 to 10 days for the dengue virus to incubate. Then dengue infected mosquitoes bites another person and the, that person gets dengue within 4 to 13 days later. So this is the mode of transmission of the dengue fever. Here in this picture you can see in the clear view. Uninfected Aedes aegypti mosquito bites to a dengue infected person. Then Aedes aegypti mosquito infected with the dengue for the rest of its life and it infects the mosquito transmits dengue to the other humans. So this is how the dengue is transmitted. Now, what are the control measures of the dengue? So at first the symptoms, that is the basic symptoms, skin symptoms, infrequent complications, vascular symptoms, vascular here and the other complications. So in case of precautions, at first mosquito control measures like nets, repellents should be used. Children should wear long sleeve dresses to avoid mosquito bites. Standing water in the neighborhood should be avoided. Observe dry day once a week. Aedes aegypti bites during day and measures to avoid it should be taken. The mosquito thrives in urban settings hence clean surroundings in, is a must. And how to treat from the viral fevers? So adequate rest is mandatory. Keep body hydrated by taking juice, soup, coconut water. This prevents dehydration. Children should consume easily digestible food. Personal hygiene should be taken care of. No self-medication. Make medicines only after seeking a physician's prescription. Pregnant women should take complete rest and a sponge bath in lukewarm water to reduce fever. So this is the easy precautions for the dengue fever. So, how can we control? At present, there is no vaccine for dengue fever. Preventive measures include elimination of mosquito breeding places by covering small water containers or putting thin film of oil on the top of the water surface in the coolers, etc. Using mosquito repellents, etc. Now, after this, prophylactic measures against communicable disease, that is, Preventive measures of the communicable disease. Preventive measures are the precautionary steps taken to check the transmission of infectious disease. Common preventive measures that include education, isolation, vaccination, sanitation, eradication of vectors and sterilization. So the first one that is education. People should be educated about the communicable disease so that they may protect themselves against infection. Next is isolation. A person suffering from an infectious disease should be segregated so that others do not catch infection from him. Next is vaccination. People should be get vaccination to avoid infection particularly during epidemic areas. Vaccination is available against cholera, typhoid, tuberculosis and many other diseases. Next is sanitation. Garbage heaps, polluted water, foods exposed to dust and flies are the chief sources of the disease causing organism. Sanitary surroundings can prevent spread of disease. 
Next is eradication of vectors. The breeding places of the vector should be destroyed and adult vectors killed by suitable methods. And the last is sterilization. Patient is surrounding and the articles of use should be sterilized. Soap, phenyl, detol and antiseptic lotions may be used wherever necessary. So this is the end of video in which we knew about the some common diseases which are common in humans and the prophylactic measures against communicable disease. So the next upcoming video will be on the immunity that is disease resistance in our body. So if you understand this video please like and share it and subscribe to my channel Nupma Biology Classes. If you have any questions, any queries or any suggestions or any comments you can ask or comment in the comment section below. Thank you for the watching.